Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Ted Robinson, a sports broadcaster who's been around uh, for a while, but has had the incredible honor that would be difficult to match of calling the last 11 Olympic Games. And as a result, having had a chance to watch, cover, chronicle great Olympic champions, two of whom are joining us here in Katie Ledecky and Laura Wilkinson. Um, for those, we'll make this very brief and I will have to go, uh, so Katie, don't be offended. We're gonna go by seniority here. <laughs> Laura is a gold medalist, Olympic champion on the platform diving in the 2000 Olympic games. And uh, that's significant because the United States has a fabulous history in Olympic diving. Uh, in recent years, another country called China has been very strong in that sport. And as a result, Laura is the only woman to win a gold medal in the pre most prestigious diving event, which is the platform since 1964. She's a three-time Olympian um, and a world champion as well, who, by the way, is trying to come back, which is something we'll dive into, no pun here, in just a few minutes for Tokyo 2020 slash 21. And Katie Ledecky, is a five-time Olympic champion, 15-time world champion gold medalist, won an Olympic gold medal at age 15, and remarkably has set 14 different world records, 14 different world record swims. And, uh, and I'm unabashedly will say she has been the best swimmer in the world. And at the same point, is also a student at Stanford and is doing that right now during COVID-19, which again, we will get into. But I, I just think these are two extraordinary examples of Olympic champions because they're not only champions in what they do, diving and swimming, but in how they've conducted themselves and how they've represented the United States, Olympic teams and athletes. So having said that, both of you, like tens of millions of others, were thrown off a very specific track by what happened in March. And, and, and so Katie, let's start with you. As, as refined and as disciplined as your regimen has been swimming, just talk about what COVID did to disrupt your planning for what you thought was going to be July 2020 is now gonna be July of 21. Right, well, first off, thanks for the kind introduction and Laura, it's great to meet you virtually. I don't know if our paths have maybe crossed very briefly in, in years past, but it's, it's fun right now to connect with Olympians at a time when we would typically be coming together as, as Team USA. So yeah, Ted, I think I saw you right at the, the beginning of COVID as this was all starting and we were out of, out of pool space pretty early on. I'm sure Laura experienced the same thing. Uh, just all the pools shutting down, everything shutting down, schools shutting down, uh, competitions being canceled, everything. and you could kind of see the postponement of the Olympics coming and it was a matter of weeks and at some point they made the decision and at that point I was able to kind of reset the, reset my mind and and start turning my focus towards this next year uh, but it was a, a stressful couple of weeks at first just not knowing what was going to happen if the Olympics were still going to happen this year. We were going to be really stressed about training and trying to find that pool space and all that. So I'm grateful that they made the decision early enough that we were able to kind of take, you know, put training on the, the back burner and, and be able to socially distance and do all the things that we knew we needed to do to help our community out. And Laura, you're based out of Texas. How did it impact you? Uh, I'm very similar. We were actually at a meet in San Antonio when everything, when the NCAAs got canceled and everything, it just seemed like the whole world just began shutting down and, and every day we were waking up to a new damage report. And so we, we came home that next Monday, I think it was maybe March 16th and um, everything here shut down as well. And we were scrambling because one of my teammates was on the World Cup team, which is where our country earns their Olympic spots. And that was going to be in April. So we were scrambling to try to find any pools that were open because we saw, I saw trials in June and, um, you know, it, that's when, like Katie said, it was kind of this panic of, of we think everything's going to shut down, but we don't know when you have to be ready just in case it doesn't. And so that 
first couple of weeks was just, it was very stressful, just the unknown, you know, and I think that's what really took a toll on a lot of us. And, and every day it was like, well, we'll decide in a month or we'll, we'll know at this point. And that was, that was so hard to hear. So when they finally decided to postpone it, honestly, I was kind of relieved, like, okay, well, at least we can stop stressing at this point. We can kind of like, you know, get, get everything back together, form a new game plan. We have time now. Um, so that was kind of like, you could breathe a little bit, but then I know for a lot of people it just set in some really, you know, other, other challenges. Like I was planning on retiring after this year and moving on to the next phase of my life as I know a lot of people were, or, you know, some people were running out of funding or they're finishing school. And so it, for a lot of people, it was a really, really difficult time. Um, one of my friends, Marielle Zagunas just made the Olympic team for fencing her fifth Olympic games. And she made the team came home and then everything was closed and it got postponed. And so she was just in a completely different space. So it was, it was good kind of like Katie said, talking to other Olympians throughout this and kind of getting a hold of where everybody was and kind of walking through it together was really actually a good thing I think that came out of it. You used a word, Laura, that I was gonna ask you. So I'll come back because Katie, I think I sensed it from you that when the decision to postpone the games was made, I sensed you exhaled, you felt relieved. For sure. Uh, Ted, you were very helpful early on in helping us find some pool space here in the Bay Area, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, but it was it was a lot of work to just figure out what to do during this time when our normal training facilities were closed. I ended up swimming in a backyard pool for three months. A very kind family let us, us swim there, and it was great. It, it did the job, uh, but by no means was I training like I would be for an Olympics this summer. So it was, it was definitely a relief and I'm glad that we now have this year to be able to plan out what we're gonna do and how we're gonna train, even if it's gonna look a little differently. And I think both of you are great examples to talk to. And Laura, you have your own children to talk to this about. How, Laura, you first, to maintain the discipline because you were disrupted, I know, athletes around the world, athletes, I think Katie, you were telling me, swimmers in Europe couldn't even leave their apartments or their flats or their housing for months because of the severity of the lockdowns in their countries. So for the two of you, and Laura first, how did you maintain the discipline to run your life and maintain some semblance of the training you need? Well, some days were better than others <laughs> that way because we yeah I have four children um, between four and and well it was eight then um, and so it, we had to homeschool also all of a sudden you know and then the homeschooling was was interesting because it's not like a traditional homeschooling it was teachers who teach in the classroom trying to throw together homeschooling so that was hard to figure out the kids not seeing their friends you know getting upset so having to battle that then trying to work out of the house and trying to train uh, it was interesting. I borrowed some some mats from our gym and I was flipping in the backyard or in the garage when it was raining, um, trying not to hit my ceiling. <laughs> and uh, we had we had daily Zoom meetings with our, our team. And so our coaches would call out like what we were doing and we would be doing like little hit workouts or something, which is divers are not cardiovascular athletes. So it was really, really challenging for a lot of us as cross training, but we would do some technique stuff. We would study video together. And that was actually really cool. It was some sort of like sense of stability, I guess, just hearing your coach in your ear at least and, and kind of, you know, walking through that together. Um, I think that really meant a lot to me. And it was cool, as annoying as it was at the beginning to have my kids crawling all over me and in my space as I was trying to work out. Cause usually I'm like, leave mommy alone. I gotta do this. I'm in my zone. Like I need my space but I, I couldn't get away from them. And so finally I just kind of chilled out and, and I let them work out with me when they wanted to or climb all over me as I was working out. And it, it was really cool because I, I wasn't just like, okay, bye, I'll see you later in three hours. I'm going to go do my thing. They actually saw what it took, you know, and they would see that I would be red and dripping wet with sweat as they're sitting there playing Legos, like watching me, or they would try to do a set of something with me and they would just die out like halfway through. And so I think they started to understand that mommy is doing this every day, a couple times a day, you know, the discipline, you have to work hard for these things that you want. And it opened up a lot of really cool conversations. So, you know, what was frustrating at first turned out to be really special. And that's a great point. I, I will come back to that. But let me get Katie. How did you stay in your zone? Yeah, I tried to just stay focused on my goals. And I was lucky to have a teammate, Simone Manuel, who stayed in the area as well. And so we were able to train in the backyard pool together, socially distanced. And also, it was just great to have her around because we were going through the same same thing and we sort of have the same mindset and approach to our sport just we're gonna do whatever it takes to be the best and put in the work that we know is necessary to reach our goals and 
so it was really nice to have her to rely on and just talk to and just know that somebody else is, is going through this. I think the swimming community came together very well and I've tried to stay in touch with my family and my friends and my teammates and it was definitely tough at first and there have been ups and downs, but I've settled into a good rhythm. I'm back in my normal training facilities, so that's been great and helpful. And I've, I feel like I've adjusted and I've, I feel like I'm still very focused for this next year and I'm excited about it, excited about the challenge, just kind of approaching it as a, a new challenge. Katie, how, have you, how are you dealing with the safety question that, again, everybody in every walk of life is dealing you as a again, highly trained Olympic athlete. Yeah, well, we, I'm being super careful with everything I do. I'm still really not going out for anything except training. And I'm still doing grocery delivery and, and all of that. And, and just when we are training, we have very strict protocols. We had to get tested beforehand and we're screened every day, temperature check, one per lane in our, in our pool. So it's, it's still, we're still being very cautious and I know we're going to continue to be that way. And I know that that's what's necessary to keep us all healthy. Yeah. How about you, Laura? Well, my kids have learned how to wash their hands while singing the happy birthday song. So they are now washing their hands much better, <laughs> much yeah. longer than they did before. Um, you know, we, we keep the hand sanitizer in the car everywhere we go. It, Texas didn't quite shut down as much as California. So we were still, you know, going to the grocery store and doing some daily things. Um, but for the most part at home, but a lot of outside time. And honestly, that was kind of nice. I mean, the sun is always you know, a great healer in a lot of ways, both uh, emotionally and physically. And so just spending a lot of time outdoors before it became 100,000 degrees outside uh, was really nice and, and good for all of us to have family time. And, and again, just talking about things, um, you know, maybe if you agreed or not agreed with, with certain things to do, um, it didn't hurt, you know, it doesn't hurt to wear a mask. It doesn't hurt to clean your hands. It doesn't hurt to sanitize things. So why not do it just in case it can help a little bit. So, um, you know, all of those things and teaching our kids why we're doing it. Yeah. Uh, one of the other components, obviously, this is a physical virus we're dealing with. But I think, Katie, you made a point about this being a new challenge. And I've been involved with mental health concerns myself over the last six years. And that's the thing I have worried a lot about is the mental health component of how everybody is dealing with. So again, you two champions. Um, Katie, how have you, you talked about how you're, you're, by the way, for those who don't know, you are on the other coast from your family. You grew up in, grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. Your family's all there. You're in California. Talk about some of the things you've tried to do to combat the mental health challenge that, that COVID-19 has posed. Yeah, well, I'm very thankful for technology. I've been able to FaceTime my family every day, and that's been great. It kind of feels like I'm in the room with them, and I know they, they feel that way as well. So there are definitely ups and downs and days where I really miss them and wish that I had traveled home earlier or, or things like that. But at the end of the day, I know that it's what's best and it's keeping them healthy. It's keeping me healthy. I'm staying committed towards my goals and they're very supportive of what I'm doing and my training and, and everything that, that I'm trying to do. So it's, yeah, I'm, I'm just staying focused on my goals. It's probably, it's kind of, I was thinking about this earlier. It's it's almost like the first real sacrifice that I feel like I've made for my swimming or or something that I I know people always ask me about sacrifices I've made for for swimming and I never viewed them as sacrifices, but now it's like I spent 3 months swimming in a backyard pool. Like I've got to put in the work now to make that all worth it because that was just a big commitment and something that took a lot of effort to go do. And I'm really grateful for that opportunity. And so I want to make the best of it over the next year. That's great. How much, because I referenced, you are a student at Stanford, you are back taking classes. How much has that helped with the challenge? That's been great. Yeah. I, I don't know what I would be doing if I didn't have that. It's, it's the biggest silver lining out of this whole thing for me. I've, I was taking this this past year off leading into the Olympics, uh, taking it off from classes to be able to travel and train to the max. And uh, once the Olympics were postponed, it coincided perfectly with the start of spring quarter for Stanford. And so 
I was able to hop on those online classes in the spring and then now I'm taking classes online in the summer and I'm going to finish up my degree in the fall. So I'm going to be graduating earlier than I expected, which is awesome. And it's been keeping me extremely busy. I've been watching the news less <laughs> uh, because I've been online watching my lectures. And so it, it definitely creates a little more balance in my life, which I really enjoy having. Now, Laura, I think I know enough to know four kids, eight and under. That's enough of a, that keeps your life balanced. <laughs> keeps you busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, well, I, I actually, and, and I totally understand what Katie is saying. Like, uh, it used to freak me out if we were out of the pool for like two weeks, we'd have a vacation, you know, at the end of season, have two weeks off and you came back and you felt like you couldn't do anything. Like you just forgot everything that you learned, you know. Um, but now I was retired for nine years. You know, I, I spent most of 2019 actually coming back from a, a two-level cervical fusion. So um, being out of the water now is not a stranger to me and it's not a scary thing to me. And we were actually out of the pool for three months. Um, you know, I was able to flip in my backyard and we were able to get back in our dry land training center um, in mid-May, but we were not able to get back in the pool until a couple of weeks ago. And so that was really hard. And divers around the world were, you know, I was seeing them post that they'd never been out of the water this long. They were really scared. And so I'm just trying to reassure everybody that it'll come back. You know, it may be a little rusty for a couple of days, but there are ways to keep your head in the game. And so trying to teach them some of the visualization things that I've done, trying to run people through, um, you know, how to handle fear and, and really trying to, to help people like helped me in return, you know, so that was pretty cool. And I, I had time to start a podcast. So I have a new podcast called the pursuit of gold, where I'm talking to other athletes and sports psychologists and nutritionists and all those things. So it kept my mind more focused on the game in a way, um, while being outside of the pool. So it, it's actually, been a great time for me to learn and to grow and and kind of to get back to yeah where I wanted to be. How much Laura do your children understand COVID and what's happening now? They say they hate the corona. <laughs> That's what they they really don't like it. And, and at the beginning it was tough, um, especially with school at home. It, it, for the first week or two it was kind of a fun novelty, and then it got real old real fast. And so we got to the point where I would have to go down to the school to pick up little packets for them. And so every day I would have a different kid like walk with me down there. It's a little over a mile away, and um, you know we would just talk about things as we were going. And and slowly they just you know would come out and they they'd be talking. All of a sudden it's like I miss my friends or. I hate this, this COVID thing, or I don't like this. I, you know, this is scary. And so it just, it gave us opportunities to talk through it. And like, it's weird. Things are strange. Like this is, this is history, but you don't have to be afraid of it. You know, fear is, is really, it's a mindset, you know? And so if you do everything that you can do, there's no point in worrying beyond that because worrying doesn't help you at all. It's not going to change anything. So do what you can control, you know, worry about the things that you can control and things you can't control. You have to let those go. So it was a really good, again, opportunity to talk to my kids but also like teaching myself again and and kind of just reiterating those things in my own mind if that makes sense it, it, no absolutely and and that so katie you last summer had your own bout with a virus i don't know the specifics obviously but you it, it impacted your performance at the world championships did, did that experience you went through help you now and did, did it make covid hit home a little closer yeah a little bit uh yeah it wasn't the coronavirus that I had last summer in, in South Korea at World Championships, um, but it, it derailed my World Championships. It pulled me out of two events, and yeah, I think it's made me appreciate my health over the, the past year, even before coronavirus, and I know the impact that it has on an individual, and now just seeing how this has impacted the whole world and I think it's reminded us all how connected we are as as a world and and how we all need to be doing our individual parts to combat this and I'm I'm hopeful that we're doing those things I'm hopeful that each individual is wearing wearing the mask and hand sanitizing and washing their hands and socially distancing uh, all of those things uh, because I think it's it's really critical yeah. So you both talked about your improv. You had to be improv artists, right? To continue to work out. Katie, you said you had backyard pools, as I know, but dry land training, right? You didn't have access to what you would normally do. Laura, I've seen your dry land workout. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I know what you're missing. But tell me, Katie, first, is it better now? We're talking in July. Is it better for you right now in your, in your entire training regimen? Yeah. So I was doing my dry land workouts just in my apartment. Uh, I, I bought some equipment, not 
all of the things that I would normally use, but I now have access to some more equipment um, at my normal training facility and and some other things. Still just kind of outdoor facilities uh, is what we're, we're using. Thankfully, the pool that I train in is outdoors and we were able to set up kind of a weight room outdoors or with open air ceilings and, and things like that. So um, doing that still in very small groups too. So it's, it's very safe and lots, of, lots and lots of cleaning of equipment and, and all of that. Laura? Yeah, it's, it's better now for sure. We have access to our dry land room and our pool where we do this in the springboard training. Um, but it's kind of the same as Katie. We've had to split our groups. Um, so the coaches are there much longer uh, just so that we can all get it in. And we have stations we rotate through and sanitize everything when we're done. Um, but we still don't have access to a pool with platforms. And because um, that's most of the universities for us in my area. And I have no idea when they're going to open. So that makes things a little more challenging because I'm a platform diver. Um, so we have a a 2.7 meter, it's not quite a three meter platform that I can do some of my takeoffs off of, but that's about all. But at the same time, you know, I have to look at the other side of things. Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of times where I've been injured and I've had to focus on visualization or studying video and doing other things to keep my head in the game and doing everything else physically that I could. And so I'm really just kind of tapping back into that and um, really trusting that that's gonna help me be prepared when we can get back on the platform. Katie, have you ever been gone off a 10 meter platform? Oh, no, <laughs> it took a lot. It took a lot for me to go off a three meter when I was <laughs> you know, t 10 years old or something. And I've, I'm not the best with heights. So I think I'm going to stay away as long as I can. And so we brushed on this. I need to tell everybody watching this, Laura, who, to, I mean, look, people can look, you've turned a little bit north of 40. I'm proof you can make it, but uh, you're trying to come back. And mm -hmm. Katie knows this great swimmer, Dara Torres, who was an Olympic veteran, who came back and competed in an Olympic Games after she had turned 40, which was astounding. You're trying to do in diving what Dara did in swimming, but what's astounding is you're doing it off 10 meters, and as I've learned, 30, what, 30 to 35 miles an hour is the speed at which you hit the water, Laura? Yeah, feels like a brick wall. <laughs> so, so, so why? Help us understand why you're choosing to do this again. You know, when you love what you do um, and you can still do it, why not? You know, it's, it, it's been, it just brings me joy. It makes me feel complete. Like it's just something that I feel called to do and we're able to make it work right now. And so why not do what you love if you can still do it? I mean, everybody told me, you know, some point you're going to retire and you'll never do it again. And um, I'm, you know, the only reason I retired at 30 was because I wanted to have kids, not because I was done diving, you know, and I came back just to play a little bit and, and playing turned into flipping and flipping turned into things coming back really quickly. And we decided to give it a whirl. And I mean, six months after I got back in the water, I got second at nationals. So we're like, okay, well, maybe I could do this again, you know, and we've had a series of other issues with, with my neck injury and, and a tough adoption. Um, but, you know, I'm still here. I'm qualified to trials. Um, I'm going to give it a whirl. You know, this is one, one more go around and it's going to be fun no matter what happens. But I, and so Katie, I, you have to understand what Laura just said. I mean, the point about passion, right? The fact you truly love what you're doing. Oh yeah. I mean, the two or three days that I had to take out of the water when coronavirus started, I mean, I, I did not like those days. <laughs> I can't imagine taking years off or retiring at this stage uh, in my career. So I think it again just reiterated to me how much I love the sport and how long of a future I I still hope to have in the sport. Yeah, so that's the point. You still you see yourself going beyond. Well, yeah. I I think definitely beyond Tokyo for another four years, and then I, at some point I'll evaluate things. I think as swimmers we take it every four years. I'm sure as diving's the same way. Uh, kind of just looking at where I'm at in life and, and all those things. But I, I, I don't know when, when the end will be at this point. I'm, I'm still feeling like I'll have many years ahead of me. Laura, I have been around athletes in team sports who have at some point said they kept playing because they wanted their kids to see them. Mm -hmm. Does that ring to you right now? Yeah, I mean, that's not necessarily why I got back in, but um, I think it's it's pretty special that they they can see me do this and, and will, you know, see me compete at a, on a big stage again. And um, they it may not understand it fully right now. My, my older two are starting to kind of understand it, but I know in the years 
to come. Like they'll be able to look back and really realize what was going on. And, um, you know, hopefully it's leaving some kind of impression on them, uh, you know, of, of what it takes to really be good at something. And, and when you want something, it doesn't matter what people say about you or what they think of you. If you think you want to do this, if this is your goal, you have to go after it because you're capable of more than you probably think you are. Um, and, and other people's opinions do not need to define you or what you're capable of doing. You define that. And so that's what I'm hoping I'm teaching my kids. Cool. Great. Uh, let me follow up on that. Katie, first, for young people that might be watching, especially young people that are participating in sports, and they're, you know, look, we know you, some of your Stanford peers had their entire spring seasons lost, uh, and you may not get those years back, whether it's youth sport. There's no Little League Baseball in America this year. Think about that. For all the young athletes that are watching right now whose sport life has been interrupted, what kind of tips or if there's anything you wanted to say or advice to a young athlete right now? Yeah, it's, it's really tough. Every level has been impacted, as you said, the professional leagues, the Olympics, youth sports, college sports, all of it. Uh, it's, it's really tough. It's tough when your big competition gets canceled or you're not even able to train or, or practice with your, your teammates who usually are your best friends. Uh, that's, that's really tough. And I think I've been uh, really inspired to see how swim teams have been able to, to come together and, and stay in touch with one another during this time through Zooms or, or other virtual meetings where they invite swimmers. And I've been on many of those uh, and, and other things. And I think that's, that's a big piece of advice I would give to just stay in touch with your friends, stay in touch with your coaches and stay focused on your goals. And, the, the work that you've put in doesn't go away it, it never goes away and it, it's always in the bank and at some point in the future, whether that's in a couple months or in a year, you're going to be able to compete again, you're going to be able to have those opportunities to let that work show so continue to put that money in the bank and at some point you'll you'll be able to withdraw it. Yeah, Laura. First of all, I love everything that Katie just said, like ditto what Katie said for sure. Um, but you know, this, this time is, is hard as it may be, or as frustrating as it may be, is really an opportunity for you. Like this is your chance to really see what you're made of and what you can do. You're going to have to think outside the box. You're going to have to get creative right now. But if you are willing to do those things and work really hard during this time, you can actually come back stronger when it's your chance to play or to get back in the water or whatever it is again. Um, use this time wisely. I mean, I, I, I learned this early on in, in 2000 before my first Olympic Games. Um, I shattered my foot in three places three months before our trial. I only had two and a half weeks back in the water before I actually got to go to the Olympic trials. And I spent that 10 weeks in a cast standing on the 10 meter pretending to dive, like going through actions, like really cranking up my mental game. And um, I actually won the trials by 40 points because in my head, I was on point and I was there and I got so much stronger because of that. I probably would have made that Olympic team regardless of breaking my foot or not, but I would not have been standing on top of the podium at the Olympic games if I had not broken my foot. I think it was a gift. It forced me to do something that I wasn't doing good enough yet. And this, this could be that gift for you. This could be that opportunity for you to rise to a whole new level. So don't look at this and, and be sad and upset. Look at this as an opportunity of how you can get ahead. Let me finish with a question for both of you because, and this is not COVID related, but it relates to your experiences. Uh, the rings behind me, this is a, actually a shot from Rio. We all understand you better than anyone, what those rings mean. But you both had that amazing moment that captured me. And it was actually in Sydney when I didn't have a chance to see Laura but I was calling baseball and the United States baseball team won the gold medal, shockingly. Tommy Lasorda, who was a Hall of Fame baseball manager, had already won World Series, was the manager coach of the Olympic baseball team. And as the flag went up and the anthem was played, he had tears coming down his cheeks. It's a guy with World Series rings, but the Olympic moment so moved him. You've both had that moment. You've both stood up there, the flag goes up, the anthem is played. Katie, what, what, what does, when I say that right now, what emotions run through your mind? Oh yeah, I, I get goosebumps every time I see that flag raised for, whether that's for me or for another athlete, a teammate. Uh, it's, it's a feeling like nothing else. And it's, it's such a great honor when you have that opportunity.
opportunity to see your flag raised for your country and and sing the national anthem and it's 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 indescribable <laughs> i can't i can't put it into words uh it's it's such a great feeling and i think the olympics is it's just such a special event so unique it's just a, an opportunity for the world to come together and you get to interact with athletes and coaches and volunteers from all over the world and you can be sitting on the bus next to somebody from literally around the world and you strike strike up a conversation you trade pins you you get to know their story and you don't get that in any other setting and it's it's moments like that that i really appreciate and that's what drives me every day and continues to give me hope about the opportunity to get to the olympics next year uh hopefully we have it all right laura take a swing at that your yeah. moment I know it is hard to describe for sure. Um, but I think it, it just in that moment, it, you realize that that everything you've been through was worth it, you know, and that, um, you know, it's the whole journey. I mean, that moment is truly special, but it's that journey leading up to it that really makes that moment special, you know, and you realize it's not just about you. It's not just, even though it might've been just your performance, you're representing an entire country. And there's just such a pride and a sense of honor um, and kind of some humility that goes into that. And it is just, just something truly special. And it only lasts, you know, as long as the anthem and then that moment is over forever. So you work all these years, all that blood, sweat and tears for this one small moment of time, you know? And so that that's why it's truly special. And I think that's why you want to do it again and again, because it is so special and it's worth striving for. Well, I, I hope everybody watching and listening now, you, you understand these are two magnificent Olympic champions and examples of why the Olympics matters and why the Olympics works. And, uh, and I hope it's helped get all of you through COVID somehow through their personal experiences. Katie and Laura, I can't thank you enough for doing this. And I hope we get to do this in Tokyo next summer. For sure. That'd be awesome. Thanks.